be here at this Cornelia. Um, look, we've had uh, a journey across 20 years that is coming to a beautiful kind of moment these days after many years where we felt all the things that people talk about here uh, that Amy spoke so eloquently about, about just being lonely, about being full of fear and, and just concern that didn't seem to have an end or a foundation or a place in which we could hold tight to uh, some notion of the future. Um, and now uh, we are in a community of care. You know, we started this journey back uh, as traditional American achievers. I think both of us would say that. I mean, I hear the introductions and I'm like, that's fine. And I hear a little voice behind my ear and still a disappointment to his mother. I mean, it's basically, she wanted more than this for me. This is, I mean, it's fine. And she's kindred to many of you here. She's a small woman from Brooklyn about this tall. No surprise, look at me. And early on, she kind of gives me the basic lay down. She doesn't say it in so many words, we're pretty close. I love, well, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. I just won't mention your name to other people. So I'm just gonna, which is kind of true. Well, years later as a reporter, I'm walking around and I'm interviewing some woman mostly, all ethnicities, all ethnicities though. And I said, there's a child other than the doctor. We've been talking an hour. Let's hear about them. This is America. This is the way we are. Make them proud. And that's kind of where Cornelia and I were as a young married couple with our two perfect children. We don't use that word anymore, perfect, by the way. We were high achievers, you know, living in that starter house. With Walter was five and almost two and a half, you know, reaching for all the things we were taught to want. And it all seemed to be working. I uh, got a job in Washington, uh, a big job as the senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal, a job you gotta kill people to get, and I killed 10 guys to get the job. <laughs> nice guys, family men, good guys. <laughs> we moved to Washington, it's a time of great excitement. We have a rented house in Georgetown. It's a new school for Walt. Cornelia's driving on around looking for new friends and play dates. New job for dad, boxes to unpack. And in a minute, every minute is a minute of greatness for us at that moment. But about a month in, Cornelia is saying something is not right with Owen. He's not talking much. And he's unhappy. Really unhappy. He was always a happy camper. And all of a sudden, he's not looking at us anymore. And his 250, 300 word vocabulary when he's, you know, two and a half, uh, is vanishing. And soon it's down to a single word, juice. And we know we need to see someone and we see a doctor who says you need to see a specialist. And we see a specialist who for the first time uses the word autism. I said, you mean like the guy in Rain Man? She's like, well maybe, he has speech. Dustin Hoffman in that movie. Some, some of them don't get speech back. We didn't hear anything else in that appointment. Nothing. Cornelia and I remember it like it was Tuesday. We lifted out of our bodies. We were looking down on this mom and dad sitting in the chairs, Owen on the rug, looking at his hands. We left those two people there. They did not leave with us. We used to miss them. We don't anymore. It took a while. And Owen vanished into silence. Interestingly, friends of mine who run centers for autism, several of them, including one up in Boston, now have a room, a special room where parents go after they hear the diagnosis. It's a warm room with colors that are soft. There's a therapist there. What we did is we got in the car and we drove. We had we're not in the car 10 minutes, we demonize that doctor. We called her the ice queen. Push her away. But it was clear that Owen was gone. He could
could not speak anymore. And off we went into the life we're living now. It was just the early moment of it. But the one thing he loves, the only thing he seems to love, he loved before the onset of the autism, the Disney animated movies. Every kid loved him that period, you remember. Okay, it's 1989. After a couple decades of Detroit, Disney comes roaring back with a movie called The Little Mermaid. How many people here have seen The Little Mermaid? Every, every single one of you. Yes, Disney's very happy about that. So all Owen wants to do, when Cornelius not basically take him to every professional hangs a shingle, is go up to the bedroom on the third floor and watch The Little Mermaid. His motor function went to hell, with one exception, his thumb on the rewind button. <laughs> At this point, he is murmuring a few months into the silence, little bits of gibberish, and we're excited. He's saying, juice service, juice service, juice service. And that's good, and we figure like baby talk. He's trying to find his way back to speech. But he thinks he wants more juice, does it? Knocks over the sippy cup. But at least it's sound. So about a year in, we have a moment. We're watching The Little Mermaid up in the bedroom. The one thing we can do as a family, and there's a scene. And the scene is, well, you know Ariel, right? You know, she's a selfish girl. Let's be frank about it. <laughs> she wants what she wants, her man. She's working at Goldman Sachs now. She's doing fine. She's a partner. She's happy. <laughs> Didn't work out with Eric the Prince, but that's off in the way. And it's that moment, the key moment, where Ariel has to trade to become human. And the sea witch says, it won't cost you but to try for really adjust your voice. Oh, and rewinds. Walter's older brother says, oh, and just watch the movie. Second rewind, third rewind. Where they graduate, it's not juice, it's not juice, it's just. My grandpa went, just your voice. And he looks at me and says, juice your voice, juice your voice, juice your voice. And he looks at me for the first time in a year. And Walter begins to say, Owen's talking again. And Cornelia starts to cry. He's still in there. The start. The next day we see our doctor, Alan Rosenblatt, the new doctor. <laughs> I, I felt the, the instinctive bond with this man. I don't know why he was a, a Jewish guy, but that's all. And, uh, <laughs> But he was good. And he said, I know you're very excited about this. We call this our Helen Keller moment. Water. Here on the seat. Can we call this echolalia? And Cornelia's like, I hate that word. So what I think, yeah. Echo. So they don't know what they're saying? She's like, why would he pick these three words out of an 89 minute movie that's gibberish? Child loses his voice, just your voice. Rosenblatt, no way of knowing. But the thinking is, they don't know what they're saying. That's when we spend years between the pet store, Parrot Talk, and Annie Sullivan. Next year, there's another bit of gibberish. Booty lies within. Booty lies within. That's Beauty of the Beast. That seems to be a good phrase, too. And our life moves forward, profoundly changed. Soon we're bankrupt. I had to borrow money from my mother. The interest rates were very reasonable, but I, it's a joke, it's a joke. We were living in a place of fear. Not even able to think about the future. Just live in the present, where Owen was living, actually. So you met the three key members of the family, you ought to meet the fourth one briefly, the older brother. The often neglected member of this architecture of autism, the sibling. The key actors often, they go through their whole life with the individual. They know them better than almost anyone. They're there to the finish of the journey. And of course, Walter, like a lot of siblings of those on the spectrum, is instantly the world's most independent five-year-old. He says, Mom and Dad have their hands full. I'm good. See ya. <laughs> it's like a character out of Dickens. <laughs> we called him the Jewish Marine. He hit the beach, feel guilty, go back. But 
anything he can handle. And, two part story, and he'd never leave his little brother behind, ever. Those two things. So Walter gets emotional on only one day of the year, his birthday, of course. It's not something we even notice. Does it fit our story about Walter? We're all story, all of us, all humans. So we make sense of the world. So on Walter's ninth birthday, he's in the backyard. His friends leave. Oh, it's back there running around. Walter gets a little weepy. Oh, it follows us into the kitchen where we bring back the cake and the plates and the cups. And he looks at Cornelia and he looks at me with his funny look in his face. Now, all mine at this point is about a three-word sentence. I want juice. After Cornelia literally has worked around the clock with wonderful therapists and specialists. But all of a sudden, it's like he has something to say. Looks at Cornelia, looks at me, looks at Cornelia. And says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan, and off he goes. It's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. We're struck silent, then we can stop talking for hours. At which point Cornelia says, look, I'm really tired. I'm up all night with them, you go to work. You're the crazy one, you wear the propeller hats at the birthday parties, find a way back in. Which is what I do that night. And that's at the center of the trailer of the movie that you're about to see. The book came out in 2014. This is the movie that is on uh, digital. Uh, and you'll get to meet the rest of the characters right here. There is a boy who is just like other boys. Until one night, he sees from his window a storm on the horizon. Howie, who are you? I'm Peter Pan, and you can. All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. The doctor says, let me explain what autism is. Some of the kids don't ever talk again. I remember thinking, I'm just going to hold you so tight and love you so much that whatever is going on will go away. We're beginning to give up hope. And one day, we're watching the Disney animated movies. And he says he doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. What the hell just happened? And all of a sudden it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. So at that point, we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue. When did you and I become such good friends? <laughs> whatever works to get to Owen. I've been scared my whole life of growing up. Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up because when you grow up, you lose all your magical childhood times. My hope is that he is independent enough to be able to grow older on his own. When I look in the mirror, I see a proud autistic man ready to meet a future that is bright and full of wonder. to fall and fail. We're not afraid of that as we used to be. I just can't believe how far Owen has come. The future, I'm still searching for it. Who decides what a meaningful life is? It's like I always say, children got to be free to lead their own lives. My family. So let's start on two. What happens here? We realize Owen memorized 50 Disney movies, everyone since Snow White in 1937. All of them. If you threw him a line of dialogue, you throw it back the next line. He could go for hours. We were taught not to hope for much. Probably somewhere up ahead of institution. And Ron, make enough money to support him for 50 years or 30 years after you're dead. All of a sudden, we see something else. These compensatory muscles. The next night, after that night with Yaga, we start, we call the basement sessions.
You go down and play scenes. Everything's in Disney somewhere. The world in the grain of sand. Eternity and L. William Blake said it. Remember high school English? It's there if you know how to find it. It's all in Disney. It's all in American Girl. It's all in astronomy. It's all in math. It's all in there. We're taught otherwise. Neurotypicals. Learn what the teacher says. Save, store, discard, move on. Get your ticket punch for the nurse around the musical chairs. I don't care if you don't remember what was on the test a week ago. You did okay on the test, didn't you? Keep going. They're inverted. They use their passions as pathways. They have no choice. It's the way they're built. All of a sudden, the lights start going off. First night, we do Jungle Book. Okay? Now, we're getting the basement. We need the big screen because we need to have a script coach. We need to refresh. He's going to outrun you. He can go hours. So we all get in roles. Now I do Baloo, which works other than the light thing, you know, fair necessities and all that. Cornelius Bagheera, the Detective Panther. Milgi, you must go to the Mandalage. Because that's her role anyway. <laughs> Walter King Louie, his older brother. Tell me the secret of man's red fire, man cub. I think that's Louis Prima. And that one's Mowgli. And we play scene by scene. That's seven scenes in. There's one where, as Baloo, I say, you know, you make one great bear. You know, it says, you think so, Papa Bear? And, and then he hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Moby and Baloo or me and Owen. And of course, Grenade says, it doesn't matter. And she's right. And off we go. We play scene by scene over years. We start living a double life. By day, Cornelius dragging on to everyone who hangs a shingle, every therapist. And we love these people. They're helping. Walter is riding to his bike to school in blizzards. <laughs> and I'm the interviewing president. Should I do that in public? Very close. And some of them are not told me the truth. I know that for a fact. <laughs> Man, I you mad at that. And at night we meditate on the emergence of the hero. The conversations that are most real are happening in the basement. Over several years, Owen gets speech back. Not the speech when he's two, Peter Pan, a different speech. There's a rhythm to it. A rhythm that I feel love for, frankly. That's Owen's voice. He learns to read mostly by reading credits. Of course. And he emerges as a teenager into that guy you see up there. Now he's path, he's down the path further. They grow and change, they don't freeze. Living their life. That's why I love Marjorie. I saw Marjorie at a conference about two years ago, and she told me about American Girl. I'm like, ah, that's us. You're doing what we do. There are people all over the country who do it. But there are few like Marjorie who has turned it into something very real, a real support, a real institution. She finds that passion that they have for the American Girl, which is huge. And American Girl is unique anyway. You know, they teach history through dolls. Like, with real beef. This is what we do, roll the grain of sand. It can be taught through anything. Find the thing they love. Why have them sit there open wide and swallow? Kids are not good at that. Their curiosity is dampened. They don't feel like themselves. And then turn it into real skills so they can have a fully realized life. Boy, that's good. This woman, I, why are we here? This woman's a pioneer. She is. And the fact is, what would be justice? That a woman like this is supported and that what she does becomes example and inspiration for people around the country. Because a lot of people can do this once they get it. That's why we're here for her. And for all the people here supporting this program. I'm going to play a very short video to show how it works.
It's only four minutes, but it's very moving. Because after the book came out in 2014, Cornelia and I were hit with a wave of people. I mean, people like Marjorie. People from all over the country say, look, look, now I get it. My kids make it sense of the world through dinosaurs, Harry Potter, Star Wars, black and white movies from the 40s, whatever it is. Now I get it. I'm ready. But they also say, how can I do what you do? My wife and I both work out of the house, and I can't spend 10 years in the basement watching Star Wars. So we built something. We grabbed the inventors of Siri and a bunch of neuroscientists, and we basically said, guess what? You're going to build something for our kids. And they said, OK. So we built a new machine called Sidekick. Here, stop it for one second so I can explain what's happening. This is a, a new kind of technology. It's a shapeable Siri that you can download. It's a character on the phone. You might work on any platform. You can feed, guide, and direct it. It also grows an automation from usage. It's just what Cornelia and I said, here's what we need. Here's what we could have used 20 years ago. Actually, no one uses it now. So when Owen talks into his phone to the character, I can hear it on my phone. And when I speak, it comes through in the voice of the character on his phone. We're having an immediate conversation to this character. And he knows we're behind the curtain. He loves it. The character grows in human essence, born of love, affection, and care, and knowing who the hell he is. So these are the first three kids to try it. Each one of these kids is on the spectrum, and each one showed a higher level of expressive and receptive speech and engagement than the parents had ever seen before the first time. So the moms and dads are behind the console. You can do a phone to phone there. Back then, you could just do computer to phone. They guide the avatar, and the kid responds. Each one of these kids' affinities is what we call them, their passions, are reflected in what content comes through. Sidekicks, it's really, it's lovely. Okay, hit the, hit the button here. Hey there, I'm Jazz, your new sidekick. Nice to meet you. Hey, I heard you really like Disney movies. Is that right? Yes. Want to watch a funny video? Yeah, I do. I don't have a skull. Or bones. <laughs> She's laughing. That was really funny. This is a very useful tool for okay. family like us. Because we are currently stuck. So we know his deficit is, but we don't know how to help him. A lot of the hard work that's been done with him in the last seven years around emotions and other people's emotions and his emotions and how they all interact. If I had had this device seven years ago, he would be a lot farther along than where he is now. I like burgers. What do you like? Pizza. Would you share it with me? Yes. If I had asked him, what do you like to eat? He would not give me that same information. That's a very simple question to yeah. us. I don't get an answer. I, I like pizza or a burger. I have visuals at home usually. Yeah. I have them on the fridge. And it's like, well, what do you think you'd like to eat? And, and he goes over there and he'll pick the visuals. At home, he only do requests. Okay. Like, I want this, I want that. It's very hard for him to initiate conversation to express himself. Thanks. Everybody say bye, house! Woody the van! Bye, house! It's kind of weird that they say goodbye to the house. <laughs> okay. Why do they do that? Because he, it, he is moving to the truck and Woody's land worked. Have you ever felt afraid or ashamed of being different from other people? Sometimes. Maybe we can watch a clip to understand how you feel. Sure thing. You belong down in Arendelle. So do you. No, Anna, I belong here. Alone. Where I can be who I am. Without hurting anybody. Have you ever been afraid and wanted to be alone? Sometimes. Why? 
because I'm because I have low self esteem and autism. Doing this, yeah. taking on this other persona in order to her, her to have a conversation, I could more anonymously talk to her, have her explain her thoughts without it being mom. Right. Which speaks volumes. Amazing to get him to this point where he's actually interacting with the devices. But I think the ease of use comes out of the use of characters. The voice also helps, the visual helps. We go to therapist a lot because in the different environment he behaves very differently. That's why I think it's good to you can do it at the therapist and then do it at home. Try to generalize the skill he learned and the practice at home. Okay. That's why I think it's a very useful app. I think it's a very good one. There's a therapist that works with her um, that she sees outside just a personal one, and I think something like this would probably be a great thing to sell to that field. But I would have used this as a tool with him, uh -huh. maybe to get him to express his feelings of grief around his father, okay. because it's always a very difficult topic, and with the use of the character, it would have been much easier to get him to talk about it. What's some other stuff in your own words about what it's like to use Sidekick? So that way I can speak to her when I'm in distress. So that way I can talk to her, her and and she and she understands how I feel. Can you think of anything that we could change or add to make Sidekick better? We can add my favorite movies like Inside Out and um, Cinderella and, and Paul Blart Mall Cop and Home and pixels. You think it was okay? Or did you like it a lot? I like it a lot. Okay, awesome. Anything else you want to share with us? Or ideas? Why about... can we get it? Oh. <laughs> Do you have any other feedback for us about Sidekick? Oh, it was really great. You know, it's really, as much as anything, about a different way of seeing these people we know and love. That's what Wesley talked about, what Cornelius says in the movie. Who decides what the meaning of life is? You know, they're very self-directed. That's their way. But they're deciding. You know, Owen seems like one in a million, 40 feet tall on the movie screen. He's actually one among millions. If we do this the way we're doing it now, based on the insights that Marjorie has and we have, there's going to be a million Owens and a million Izzy's. You know, we live kind of on a snow-capped peak here in Westchester County or in Cambridge where we live. It's a big country, but they're getting it. That's hopeful. So let me just finish with our star, Owen. Now, Owen uh, developed the philosophy. Uh, and this is what I find with all the kids. I mean, I say, what's your thing? They say, pick one, dinosaurs. I'll just give you one example to show how big this is. I'm at a speech, and the young lady says dinosaurs are great. So you teach me something. They're never asked that, by the, by the way, ever. She's like, what do you want me to teach you? I said, well, first tell me what's your favorite dinosaur. She's like, I don't want to tell you, you'll laugh. Since Jurassic Park, everyone laughs. I said, okay, try me. I promise I will laugh. Okay, okay, my favorite is the Velociraptor. I'm like, yeah, that's a monstrous, bloodthirsty animal. I'm going to get that. Why the raptor? Well, it's a pack animal. You see, raptors are pack animals. And, well, animals in a pack are not all the same, after all. You know, and if they notice who's in the pack and what they do well and work together, they can take down a much larger dinosaur. So it's about interdependency and how we rely on each other, which is why I love the raptor. What's happening? She's drawing from her affinity what she needs to make her way in the world. I consider that brilliant. Eventually, we'll give them credit for that compensatory muscle, and there are a lot of them. And that's part of the strength-based model that we're here to support. And in that strength-based model, you've got a young actor, Owen. Now, Owen is, these days, out there at screenings with me and Cornelia. 
He says, I just want to be accepted and known for who I am. Well, now they cheer like crazy. He's like Elvis. <laughs> and so they ask him, how does it feel to be a celebrity? He's like, I'm not a celebrity. I'm a person being celebrated. They're different. <laughs> Correct. And now he says, I'm an artist being celebrated because he draws beautifully. I'll just give you his words here. He says, Walter, his older brother, says, Owen is our best teacher. That's right. Walter works for the Elizabeth Warren Agency, uh, the CFPB. I think the Parker County Executive probably hates that agency, but it's a good one. <laughs> he says, I wouldn't be who I am if Owen's not who he is. And the parts about me which are most prized are the ones that I built because of him and with him. So when it all started to unfold, and we started to see it, and Owen started to sort of lead a little bit, he gave us all identities in the house. We were all sidekicks. No heroes. As he explained, a sidekick helps the hero fulfill their destiny. They're really important. He viewed himself as a sidekick, not a hero. Part of that is he saw what the world saw of him. But then he explained it to us. Without the sidekicks, nothing happens. They help the fear fulfill their destiny. They drive the plot, the big plot. And so now, people say, how does it feel to be a hero? He's like, I don't know about that word. You see, here's what I think. I think we're all really sidekicks. At our best, when we help others fulfill their destinies. And, and on that day, we find our inner heroes. I love that. And what we have in this room is a room full of sidekicks. Help others fulfill their destiny. And on that day, find their inner heroes. Cornelia, who has been driving this show from the get-go, with her enormous wisdom, said, Owen oh, helped us find our inner heroes. So I have enormous joy now that I can introduce the hero of my journey, my wife, Cornelia. I told them this morning, Mom and I are going to be at this thing, and he said, uh, who's going to be there? I said, it's the American girl people. And I sent the email of Izzy with the picture. So and he's like, oh, Izzy, yeah. And who else? Well, other people who were, you know, in the helping professions and support them. And he's like, okay, well, Dad, you want to do a voice? Owen does the voices, usually. But he sometimes gives me permission to do them. <laughs> so these are scenes, there are hundreds of them that we've used as language. The language of the heart, the language of resilience, Courage, struggle, and triumph. And this is one of Owen's top tens. I mean, it's a beauty. It's called the love business. He says, do love business for them as best as you can, Dad. <laughs> it's a scene from a movie. Some of you have seen this one, The Sword in the Stone, 1963. Anyone see that one? Yeah, not as many, right? Yeah, it's a while ago. It's a great one. Merlin and Arthur. Arthur's a boy, Merlin is Merlin. And there's a moment in the movie where, remember, he turns Arthur into a squirrel? And then there's a girl squirrel who sees Arthur and they kind of fall in love, and then Arthur turns back to the boy, and the girl squirrel, squirrel is heartbroken and crying. And Merlin and Arthur walk off. And Arthur's quizzical, and Merlin is gentle. And he says, You know, boy, this love business is a powerful thing. Arthur says, greater than gravity? And Merlin says, well, yes, my boy, I believe it's the most powerful force on Earth. And so Owen says, do all the business for them. Tell them that I know there is love in this room. And I send all my love to them. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about, isn't it? These are the places we get to show up. 
Thank you all for coming out this morning.